Chandra from the NR Hour Sports Show. This is episode 974. We are joined by a really special guest. His name is Brandon Lloyd. Everybody knows him. Former NFL wide receiver. He went to Illinois for college. Uh, what a great career. Uh, he put up some amazing numbers throughout his career. He played for the 49ers, Washington Commanders. Uh, now the new team there, Chicago Bears, Denver Broncos, uh, Los Angeles Rams. But he played for the St. Louis Rams. Uh, New England, New England Patriots, uh, obviously, and then back with the 49ers. And man, like I said before, great career. Now he's doing big things off the field. Um, and man, <laughs> uh, I, and also he's he was one of Tom Brady's favorite uh, receivers to play with. So we're gonna get to all of that. And Brandon Lloyd, I just want to say thank you for joining the show. We are live on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Spotify, on all the podcast platforms, and. Um, I had this app called Spreaker, so our fans can join in and ask questions also to Brandon. But first of all, happy Saturday, and uh, how are you and your family doing? Awesome. Happy Saturday. Thanks for having me on. We're doing well. We, uh, we are, we, we're happy. Um, plugging along. Uh, my kids are just finishing their basketball season. Oh, wow. Uh, getting ready to go into track season and uh, keeping their grades up. So that's definitely something that's, uh, that's important uh, in my personal life. Thanks for asking. Yeah, no problem. Uh, speaking of uh, your kids, real quick, what is scouting for on the? <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to be. Um, they're not going to uh, go to college for <laughs> for uh, for any sports. Um, uh, you know, as as much as I would love to live vicariously through them, um, they <laughs> definitely are are choosing a less stressful route. <laughs> Yeah, so um, <clears throat> first we're going to start off with your career and journey. And uh, so tell our fans uh, about your football. Uh, when did you start getting into football? And who, who would you say um, your biggest role model was uh, when, that, that you looked up to while you were working on your craft? Oh, goodness. I, uh, I, I started playing football in the third grade in uh, uh, flag football in Blue Springs, Missouri, outside of Kansas City, and um, uh, the Pop Warner Football League. So that was that that was the inception. Uh, but uh, leading up to that, you know, I know it's Olympic time, so I, I love talking yeah. about the Olympics. But, you know, my life was just filled with sports. I was completely obsessed with sports um, uh, from the Olympics to uh, professional sports. You know, we had a, the Sports Illustrated subscription. So I was just consuming copious amounts wow. of sports and uh, reading about it and the pictures and following it. And um, I, I guess I'd say uh, my, my role models when I was younger in sports, my uh, first one was my father, mm -hmm. who was the one who introduced me to football and then the manner that he introduced it to me. Um, just because I was, as a youth, I was struggling with anger and um, uh, just m misplaced, misguided energy. Right. And my dad said, you know what you need to do? You need to, you need to play football. You yeah. need to do something. You need to play football. You need to box. Because <laughs> he was a Golden Glove boxer. So he's like, you need, wow. to, you need to do something positive. And so uh, I said I'd play football. So he took me to the library. Hmm. And uh, I checked out uh, Buddy Ryan football. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, it was a VHS and a couple books on football. And that was the inception. That's, that's what I remember as my introduction to football was putting the VHS in and starting at, you know, the three point stance, two point stance, wow. going through all the positions, all the responsibilities and saying to myself, all right, all right I can do this. And then um, my second role model was my older brother, Mark, who was four years older than me. Uh, he was already engaged in uh, football yeah. and and he was a role model just because of his um, uh, collegial nature. <laughs> he, right. you know, he was he was likable. He was nice. He was extremely intelligent. He was athletic. Yeah. Um, he was good looking, and so it was just <laughs> like he had like all these components to it to the off the field. But then he also was a fantastic on the on on the field. So yeah. that, that was the inception of uh, of football in my life. Yeah, it's always I, it's always good to have role models in your family, right? So that's that's the main thing. Um, so for you, obviously, you're a receiver, but uh, in this generation, coaches love to ha have players play multiple positions, be versatile. So for you, uh, did you get to learn any other uh, positions in um, like in college in high school football uh, other than receiver? Of course, of course. You know the the 
and my brother was a quarterback, so I naturally wanted to be a quarterback. And I actually thought I was following in his footsteps uh, to be a quarterback. So I played, so naturally I played the quarterback position. <laughs> and um, uh, my brother Mark was the, the first uh, black quarterback at our high school, Blue Springs oh, wow. High School. Um, he was the first black homecoming king and the varsity quarterback. He's just like so many, he was just, I admired him so much uh, oh. as a youth, still admire him, but I admired him so much as a youth. I was like, all right, that was my trajectory. I was in trouble way too much to be home. <laughs> 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 so I was like, all right, I, I could be varsity quarterback. And I, I ended up achieving that at um, uh, my sophomore year. In, I was starting varsity quarterback hmm. uh, my sophomore year in high school. And, um, and, that the summer going into my junior year, um, the head coach, Bob Beatty, who's a Hall of Fame high school football coach down in Trinity in, um, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, uh, called my dad over from the parking lot. My dad would sit out in his lawn chair in the parking lot and watch, watch uh, football practice. Wow. He kind of whistles my dad over. And so my dad, has to, he has probably like a 70-yard walk. So he like folds <laughs> his lawn chair up and Moses is onto the football field after practice and uh bob Beatty says to me um the uh superintendent's son's moving in in town this this summer and he's a quarterback he's like so mr lloyd he's like i know you can uh understand this and appreciate this um i want to keep my job right so i'm going to start him at at starting quarterback mm-hmm. brandon you have one of two options you can back him up or you can pick a new position so my dad's looking at me like, what you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so um, I, I said, all right. You know, at that time, my favorite player was Deion Sanders anyway. Yeah. You know, I, con- I had read uh, Deion Sanders book, mm-hmm. um, uh, Money, Fame, Power, uh, yeah. how uh, drug, sex and mm. alcohol uh, almost ruined my life. It was the autobiography after he uh, attempted suicide wow. um, uh, f- with the, uh, after playing in the Super yeah. Bowl San Francisco 49ers team. Um, and it was a, it was a, he co-wrote it with TD Jake. So it was incredibly <laughs> inspiring and spiritual book. Right. Um, but at the same time, I was also consuming um, uh, Deion Sanders uh, prime time, you know, remember the song must be the money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, I was, I was consuming a lot of that. And then I was reading all the articles just because yeah. of just the fantastic career he had. I mean, I followed it all the way through Sports Illustrated. It was just spectacular uh, career. And it was just like, like none other. And, and so I was like, all right, I'll, uh, I'll play defensive back. Bob well, Beatty says, cool, you can do cool. that. And he said, uh, but I also want to play wide receiver. He says, all right. And uh, with the offense he was running, we ran the run and shoot. And so we were, you know, which was the spread offense uh, mm-hmm. now. So we ran a pretty uh, forward uh, offense. It was actually based after the uh, Houston Oilers and what yeah. Warren Moon was running down there, the uh, four wide receivers and moving them all around and, and slinging the ball a bunch and, uh, and running out of a, a one back set. And uh, so we uh, built in our, our uh, special teams off of our offense. So the quarterback was also the kicker and uh, was also the punter. Mm-hmm. So, but I was also the kicker because in Kansas City, my favorite Kansas City chief was Nick Lowry. <laughs> it was the kicker. <laughs> so I taught myself how to be how to kick when I was a young age too. So I was I, I could kick soccer style when I was really good at um, wow. uh, kicking long distance. So I said, I also want to be, uh, can I still be the kicker and the punter? He said, you got it. So that was how I switched over um, out of the quarterback position. Oh, and so cool. when I was recruited uh, to colleges, uh, I was recruited as a defensive back. Hmm. And then second position was wide receiver. Wow. So for you, uh, that, that Deion, uh, speaking of the books, um, there's a book you should definitely check out. It's called Endor Season from Tommy Harris Jr. Um, I'm reading his book right now. And uh, obviously, you know, I'm a former Chicago Bear. And um this guy, his, his story is like inspiring right now. And you should definitely check out his book. And I'm going to definitely check out Deion Sanders' book. And that, that, that must have been heartfelt and uh, really inspiring to you, too. Yes, yes, it was. And, you know, especially at the time when, um, you know, it's, it was, it was the, the vulnerability. <clears throat> and, and, and it was a time where we just didn't have that much access yeah. to 
uh, professional athletes in that manner. And that book was, was um, it, it was right on point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell us some, tell, uh, tell our fans um, about your college recruitment process. Obviously uh, you went to mm-hmm. Illinois, but uh, how many offers did you get coming out of high school and what made you choose Illinois? Yeah. Yeah. The, the high school process was fun mm-hmm. uh, for me uh, because it was, you know, I came out in 1999. Right. So this was the same. This was just uh, uh, maybe a, a year or or two. It was probably two years after the movie Blue Chips came out. Hmm. You remember Blue Chips? No, 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 Nick no not really. Nick, uh-huh. Nick, yeah, Nick, Kill O'Neill, okay. Anthony Hardaway were in this basketball okay. movie about um, uh, uh, college cheating. So okay. this was like Shaq's, you know, first yeah. couple years in the league. Um, Anthony Hardaway also, okay. yeah. uh, just about college cheating and just all the scandal uh, oh, wow. that goes on behind the scenes on a college uh, basketball team. And then um, the second movie that was out was He Got Game. Mm-hmm. I know uh, that one. Uh, Denzel yeah. Washington yeah. and Ray yeah. Allen. Mm-hmm. And so when I was sitting thinking about the college process, I was like, all right, I want to have this type of experience. <laughs> 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 right? And so um, uh, uh, obviously – you know, I, I wanted to do it in a cleaner manner, but I still wanted that type of experience. Mm. Um, and because that was actually the first time where it was uh, visualized yeah. um, uh, in cinema form and cinema format. So um, I was recruited by, you name it, every single Division One school. Um, uh, the, the, my criteria for selecting uh, colleges was... Um, my uh i'm the last of seven there's six college degrees yeah in our in our family and so uh graduating college was important the the uh getting the degree all the discipline and lessons that come along with getting that uh all are the life lessons for uh being black in america yeah that that was the message that my uh, parents were were teaching us Mm -hmm. so um when it, uh, I started getting my first recruiting offers my sophomore year in high school. Um, it was uh, for defensive back. Okay. Uh, started with the Big 12 schools. It was uh, or the Big Eight at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so uh, started uh, the locally with the uh, K State and MU, and uh, we were traveling around with our seven on seven football team, getting exposure. Um, started getting exposure. For, uh, uh, we won a university. University of Illinois, seven on seven camp. That was my first Big Ten exposure, and and so that's where my first introduction to the University of Illinois was oh. my uh, was my junior year, um, and so my oldest sister Denise, um, who's a, a, a PhD, uh, she's a vice president over at, up at Winona University now. Uh, when I was selecting my uh, colleges. She said to me, she goes, you know what, Brandon, this is a use, use situation. Yeah. They're going to be using you and they're going to make millions of dollars off, off of you. And in return, you need to use them mm-hmm. and get a degree that means something in this world. Right. So that's how I approached the recruiting process. Mm-hmm. So all the schools, uh, you know, I was, a, I was a ham when I was growing mm-hmm. up. Um, I, I was, you know, I was in, I was in choir ever since elementary school. I did the, uh, student run, um, newscasting. So I was doing the man on the streets and Hmm. interviews at at school on the, on the television station. And, and so I loved entertainment. So, uh, I, I said to myself as like, you know, I, I would, the best fit for me would be journalism. Right. So all the schools that I was selecting for college all had journalism programs. They, mm-hmm. uh, it was uh, University of Illinois, which was top three in 1999, uh, University of Missouri. They were, you know, top three around the same. Yeah. And um, uh, I was considering UCLA, uh, but I didn't take a visit there. So I had my two schools that were uh, broadcast journalism programs. And then I selected uh, two other schools that were uh, Big 12 schools. I took a visit to Kansas State. And uh, I took a visit to Oklahoma mm. um, uh, because Mike Stoops was just leaving uh, Kansas State as the defensive back coach and was taking oh. a, um, a position with his brother at Oklahoma mm. uh, at that time in 1999. So uh, that's how the, car- the, the cards were laid out 
uh, for me to attend college. That was the uh, mentality behind it. But then uh, taking it a step further, uh, what, why I chose the University of Illinois was because the, the environment when I was recruiting trip was uh, the most inviting. The, uh, of the four trips that I went on, on three of the trips, there was uh, racist undertones. Oh. So uh, in, the, in the college recruiting process, there's naturally, it's naturally segregated. And that's just to eliminate any, you know, error. They, they keep the black recruits with the black student athletes and the white recruits with the white student athletes. Hmm. You know, I think they're just playing it safe. Yeah. So um, on three of my visits, in some way, form or fashion, um, the student athlete that I was paired with um, uh, uh, made a racist comment. And me, I came from Blue Springs High School. I came from a predominantly white high school. Uh, I grew up, I did not have a problem with white people. White people did not have a problem with me. So um, naturally, I was communicating with everybody once the, you know, when the parents were all together and the players were all together and there would be players from uh, my school, actually, yeah my high school that were on these same trips and I couldn't spend time with them because the recruit, because the host would say, you know what? We don't deal with them. Hmm. Racial slur, insert any racial slur. Um, we don't deal with them yeah. out here like that. Hmm. And so um, that happened on three recruiting trips. Uh, um, one of those recruiting trips, I didn't even go out with my host. I had a, a first cousin who was on campus and I just kicked it with him and his dorm. I, you know, and that, and that host just pocketed all the per diem money. And, uh, and my point was, my point is, is that when I was at Illinois, it didn't happen like that. Uh, we got on campus, um, University of Illinois had at the time in 1999 had the largest Greek system in the United States. So, you know, we went to uh, white fraternities, we went to the bars. We went to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we hung out at the um, uh, the the, uh, the black fraternity after set. Mm. <laughs> we hung out with the offensive linemen, you know, and and I use that because you know they were predominantly yeah. white. So we hung out with the offensive linemen. We hung out with the the, the skilled position guys, and it was all in one trip. And it was kind of like mm. like this is how I want to live uh, my life. I intentionally did not select any schools below the Mason Dixon line because mm -hmm. I didn't want, I didn't want any of, uh, of that, um, type of distraction. I intentionally did not, uh, select the schools in the ACC or uh, yeah. ACC, um, because I, you know, Florida state or Miami to be specific, uh, because I, when I was looking at, when I look in sports illustrated, like, Oh, this player's stealing from JC Penney's or this player's, you know, uh, caught up in a scandal or this play they're fighting or, you know, uh, uncle Luke, <laughs> you know, it's like all so sorts of distractions that I was saying to myself, I just didn't want any part of because I was going there for one to get an education and two, if I'm good enough, they'll find me. Yeah. What I was, what I said to myself was, you know, Jerry Rice went to Mississippi Valley A&M, mm -hmm. uh, uh, HBCU. Yeah. If they found him at an HBCU, then, they can find me at yeah. a Power Five school if I'm good enough. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that was the that was how I uh, selected Illinois. Wow, that's an amazing amazing thing there. And obviously, we're still dealing with diversity, which we'll get to later because uh, you, I'm sure you see the NFL news right now with Brian Flores. So I, I, I want to ask you that later on, and um, I think there's you still need to still <clears throat> work to do to bring diversity back in. And, but for you though, obviously, uh, what was the experience like playing at Illinois and uh, obviously a great, pro, great college football program and they're, they're, they're growing big time. And for you, what was it, what was it like for you there? The atmosphere playing in front of the fans and uh, what was that like for you? Oh, I mean, it was everything it was cracked up to be, you know, it, it was, um, it was a dream come true. Everything just worked out exactly uh, how I envisioned it. You know, I, I asked Ron Turner uh, uh, because I was a, um, a seven foot three high jumper coming out of high school. I was 25 foot long jumper. I was running um, uh, high 13s and the 110 hurdles. And so part of 
uh, how I was marketing myself as a, uh, a student athlete was I was a two sport athlete. Yeah. And so all the schools that I was entertaining were all allowing me to run track also. So um, that was part of my agreement to go to the University of Illinois. Um, well, there, there was two parts of that agreement. <laughs> uh, one part, the first part was that I would be able to run track. Mm -hmm. The second part was that I'd have an internship at oh. a major uh, network uh, in a major region yeah. uh, by my junior year in college, hmm. right? Um, uh, my vision was, uh, you know, because this was right around the time uh, ESPN radio came yeah. out and, um, and uh, syndic nationally syndicated radio. And I was saying to myself, ooh, I was like, ESPN radio, I, I think it was called The Score. Hmm. And I was like, ooh, I was like, I want to be on ESPN <laughs> radio. I have my, I have my heart really set on that. And so I got those two confirmations. But uh, starting at the University of Illinois, it was, um, you know, it was hard. <laughs> um, uh, Ron Turner came from the NFL. And so he believed in two a day practices. He believed in isolating uh, the team. Uh, we, so we went to Rantoul, Illinois, and we stayed at a uh, abandoned military wow. barracks. And we did that for uh, two and a half weeks prior to school starting so we went out there summer was hot and humid and um and it was hard it was it was painful it was um uh you know it it, it built character it was um you know as i reflect back on it it was it was very traumatizing yeah in the sense where it was you know every morning was a decision that had to be made right you know am i gonna get up and rip these covers off and walk out of this door and get to the mill hall so I can to get to that hangar and get my pads on? Or do I stay in bed and hit snooze and, and yeah. not make it? And this is the time where, you know, Ron Turner was, he was giving kids uh, Greyhound bus tickets, send them kids all the way back to Cali. Wow. He was not playing with, he was not playing with players. And, and so it's like this mentality of like, what, 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 what my life end up? How will my life end yeah. up? What will I be if I don't get up and do this? And it was that discipline mm. of getting up, showing up. And what I realized was it was like, when I, by the time we did that zombie march and shoved that gruel in our <laughs> face and got into that practice, and by the time I put the pads on and the sun rose wow. and, and the dew lifted <laughs> off the grass <laughs> and we got out there and practiced, I was in love. <laughs> I was like, it was so worth it. <laughs> it wow. was so worth it. It was it it was worth the the effort and the trauma to go through that uh, two times a day because it happened again. Because mm -hmm. then we had lunch, we had meetings, and then we had lunch. We had a short nap, and again, could not be late for that oh. one either. So it's like the same process two times a day um, in there. And they're just um, Ron did such a great job with the team. Um, that first year, we ended up. Um, win enough games to go to a bowl game. So we went to micronpc.com bowl game <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. And, um, and which was a great experience because we got to do the, have the whole bowl experience and get money and get gifts and, you know, and, uh, and swag. And we got a chance, we got a ring for that, for that effort. But um, I had incredible mentors. Um, uh, Michael Dean, uh, who was a fifth year wide receiver. And, um, uh, it, the, the experience at Illinois, it was, it was everything that I, I dreamt of. I had yeah. a mentor who looked like me, you know, he was, he was just super fly. He was, you know, um, uh, from Key West, Florida. I mean, I mean, he's just, he's just, you know, he was good looking, you know, uh, he looked like P Diddy to me <laughs> when I was in college. You know, he, he, he talked professionally. He gave me his, uh, his suits. And clothes, and he, he's the one who said, he's like, you know what? He's like, you, you need to start dressing nice. You need to start looking nice. You need to start carrying yourself nice. You need to start making sure that um, uh, you're staying out of trouble. And he just like pointed me in the right direction uh, at a pivotal time in my life. And it was just, um, Illinois was an incredible experience. You know, you know, ended up, um, uh, I fractured my second year. And... Um, so I didn't get to play in the uh, 2000 campaign, but it was just an amazing uh, experience, just the, uh, the access and the privilege that I had as a, 
uh, student athlete on the football team where it was like the school uh, opened up journalism classes to me. <laughs> you wow. know, these are the classes that I couldn't take unless yeah. that students can't take until they're a junior. And so they opened up uh, journalism classes because I could start taking classes later because I was going straight from class to rehab mm -hmm. and then to study hall because I didn't have to do any uh, football related activities. So, you know, just even that process of, of loss of not having football, but then being able to um, really engage academically and then um, get engaged socially. You know, it's like I actually got to be a student. You know, I got to go to sorority parties and <laughs> um, uh, barn dances and um, uh, fish and shoot guns on the weekend, wow. you know, like, you know, and uh, clay shoot on the weekend. You know, it was just like uh, I had a, a full college experience. And so yeah. when I when I recovered and came back, you know, I was I was fulfilled like as a person and ready to uh, engage back in football. And, and I did, you know, bounce back that, that my um, second year on the football field, third year in school, wow. thousand yards, uh, a big 10 championship, Sugar Bowl, <laughs> you know, and it was just, it was incredible, you know, got to play with Kurt Kittner and oh. um, um, the, uh, and then going into that, my, um, my, junior year ron turner honored agreement and so he sent me to i didn't get to go to st Lu chicago he's like that's a little too far he's like i'm gonna send you to st louis and so i, I got to intern for fox sports net st louis wow. and that was a really another amazing experience with that um group it's a you know brand new affiliate of the fox um the fox family i got to cover i got to cover the uh, st louis rams um mm. Uh, this is 2001, St. Mm -hmm. Louis Rams, the um, uh, Air, the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, oh. the um, and I got to c cover a little bit of the St. Louis Blues right there, um, but uh, you know I, I had a, 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 a Fox affiliated TV show, Big Man, at the University of Illinois, so I was interviewing my teammates, um, uh, coaches, and the basketball team, and uh, in that internship. Uh, that was where I got uh, introduced to the NFL. Wow. Um, uh, covering the St. Louis Rams, uh, Tory Holt and Isaac Bruce whistled yeah. me over. Mm. I was just on the sideline covering it with the had my press pass, and they whistled me over. And I'm kind of like, I mean, should I like what am I doing? They're like, B Lloyd, <laughs> get over here, B Lloyd, get over here. And I'm like, what am I doing? And my uh, colleague at the Fox Sports Net St. Louis says dude, you better get over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's Tory Holt and Isaac Bruce. And I was like, is it going to be a violation? He's like, dude, don't worry. I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> so I, I ended up walking over there on the football field. They invite me to lunch, hmm. um, you know, out there in Earth City. And so I go in there to lunch and Isaac Bruce and Tory Holt proceed to tell me how to make it to the NFL. Wow. Hmm. The, the question was, they said, you going pro? He's like, you're at are you going pro? I was like, oh, dude, I just completed my second year, on, uh, you know, on the football field. They're like, you're eligible. Are you are you going? I'm like, I don't I don't even know where to begin. So they started with <laughs> drills. Like, here's a set of drills. You know, uh, this is a time I was wearing tape on my fingers. Hmm. So they said, you know, you need to get that tape off your fingers, put some gloves on because it makes it easier to catch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, here's the drills. Get disciplined. Work, start working, um, working more in the off season, catching, yeah. catch on the jugs machine. And then here's a mentality going into each game, you know, start focusing on, um, you know, getting 50 yards a game, uh, start there, uh, no drops. And they really just started instilling in me that the NFL is actually a possibility because at the time I, I didn't know that. Mm. I just thought I was, you know, going to school, <laughs> you know, uh, holding up my end of the bargain. I was, you know, two sport athlete. I was being yeah. a student athlete. I was, you know, I thought I was getting good grades at the time, but when I got my transcripts later, I did, I wasn't, <laughs> but you know, uh, I was going to class and I was doing my best and, and I didn't realize the NFL was a, an option wow. until those two players s told me about myself mm -hmm. and, uh, gave me some tools to start thinking about. Wow. I, what are two great players to learn from? And then obviously you're a fellow receiver learning from Isaac Bruce and Tory Holt. Isaac Bruce are finally a Hall of Famer and Tory Holt heading that way too. 
So let's go. Oh, man, blessings. So many <laughs> blessings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, what an awesome story right there. That 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 story uh, should uh, motivate other young uh, players too. And um, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, and you know what I left out was you know in that in that first training camp. That's when I got moved to wide receiver. Oh. Um, okay. uh, doing those training camps. Uh, when I was when I came into the University of Illinois, I was a defensive back. Yeah. I was going both ways. You know, just because they they moved, they were put me out as a slash, mm -hmm. uh, as an athlete. I can play defense or yeah. wide receiver because I did that in high school um, for the last two years. And in training camp, one of the senior receivers blew his knee out, mm -hmm. and and I wasn't much for tackling anybody anyway. I was <laughs> yeah. about 150 pounds. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, I mean, you know, they said the student body left coming my way at cornerback. And I was like <laughs> on skates all the way on the, on the, on the sideline. And so I was, uh, I was a fifth, I was a fifth back, uh, fifth DB, uh, a nickel back. And one of the senior wide receivers blew his knee out. Mm -hmm. And during training camp, I would do some DB and then the one-on-ones I do wide receiver. And mm -hmm. as you can imagine, the one I want, like I was jumping over guys, yeah. and, you know, I was doing pretty spectacular stuff as uh, a wide receiver. And, um, and one of the senior receivers blew his knee out. Ron Turner asked me if I wanted to uh, switch to wide receiver full time. I asked him, am I going to play? And he says, yes, you're going to play. <laughs> I'm like, all right. I was like, wow. I'll switch. And so they moved me to wide receiver and it was just, you know, ended up uh, earning a starting role, starting position wow. um, my freshman year. And it was like off to the races. Wow, your story reminds me of Travion Diggs from the Cowboys. Um, he used to be a receiver, and they they Nick Saban switched him to defense, defensive back. So, uh, so it's kind of like it's similar to your story. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like doing anything to get on the field, <laughs> uh, having confidence in, in 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 my talent to go out there and make the plays, and <clears throat> and and the discipline, and and just sticking to it. Wow. Yeah, so uh, we are live with former Illinois NFL wide receiver Brandon Lloyd. Fans, please tune in. We do have a fan question that just came in, and oh, one great. of our yeah, one of our, one of our fans want to know who was the toughest defensive back you had to face throughout your career. Yeah, yeah, I get that one a lot. <laughs> I always pick, I always pick uh, Al Harris and Mike McKenzie when they were the duo in Green Bay. Mm -hmm. That was early in my career. Oh, yeah, they were just. Um, they were so tall and long and then the scheme that they ran, you know, it was, um, uh, you know, they, they had safety help over the top so they yeah. can just be super physical at the line of scrimmage. Uh, they were intimidating. They were fly, you know, they were, they were getting all kind of fines. They have all green socks on <laughs> out there. They had colorful shoes. I mean, it was just like, uh, they were, they were fly and, um, and they were awesome. And then, you know, they were just, um, they had a, you know, they were thugged out yeah. out there on the field. It was like they were, they would fight. They would come up and hit and tackle. Yeah. It was just, it, it was just, it was awesome. <laughs> it was, it was awesome to see and and look at. It wasn't fun to play against because yeah. um, the offensive coordination just did, well, the teams I played on didn't have an answer for that. Oh. They, didn't, they didn't have an answer for that. And so it, it was tough because for me as a young receiver, I was just have to go out there and just kind of, you know, take it on the chin because those dudes were coming <laughs> after. They, you know, they didn't take it easy on anybody. Wow. Yeah, so this is a two-part question. So tell our fans about some of your best moments at Illinois College. And uh, I found an interesting story about your family. And um, you were the first person in your family not to finish college uh, because you, you declared for the draft in 2002. And your mom, tell, about, tell us about the story about your mom uh, during that time. Yeah, yeah. The, um, um, so the, I, I, I'll, I'll say the, the best moment at University of Illinois was winning the Big Ten Championship. The, uh, I, I always love it because the, the motto going into that year, Ron Turner picked, he said, well, why not Illinois? And so that's what we had on our T-shirts. Like, why not Illinois? Like, why not us? Our... Um, my freshman year in 1999, we went in uh, for the first time in 50 years. Uh, a Big Ten team went into Ann Arbor and went into um, Ohio State into the Horseshoe and, and beat them. Mm. Um, oh, and a uh, shout out Tom Brady. We beat Tom Brady that year in 99. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, um, he actually blew a comeback lead in mm. that game. Wow. 
That's, <laughs> so he learned his lesson. Yeah. But, um, uh, the um, uh, going into the Big Ten championship year, having that attitude was like, why not Illinois? It's like, why not all of us? You know, this. Wh why shouldn't we be in a Big Ten or the uh, BCS bowl game? And we really stuck to that motto. We stuck together. Uh, had the same discipline. We looked out for uh, one another. It was just incredibly close team, and and we did it. Uh, we outright Big Ten champions. That was the first time I'd ever won a championship in a team sport. I was, I won all the time in track and field, yeah. <laughs> but um, and a team sport. That was the first time I actually won a championship, and it was just, it was, it's just, it's a surreal moment. It's, it's just, um, uh, um, uh, an incredible achievement, team achievement, um, that uh, that had a lot of. Uh, individual participation in so it was like it was I, I really uh felt uh redeemed after uh I feel like I left let my teammates down by missing that right. my sophomore campaign and then to be able to come back and really deliver was just like it was really fulfilling oh, that's awesome. um uh leaving school early yeah bitter it was bittersweet because mm -hmm. yes you know this uh opportunity that I had um because it was you know for me it was, i was so focused on finishing school and doing what my parents taught me to do and yeah and, and executing that and doing that that I, I really wasn't focused on the nfl and so I, how, how i typically describe it is the nfl happened to me it it wasn't something that i was really legitimately going after um uh um even after my experience with uh, Tory Holt and Isaac Bruce, it was kind of like, dude, really? <laughs> like, you really? <laughs> and, um, you know, I was so small and, you know, the, the team wasn't all that hot. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, me? <laughs> and so it really took a little bit of time. And then, but, you know, my final campaign there at the University of Illinois was able to uh, get another, have another thousand yard campaign. And uh, the, the, the decision was mainly because the team wasn't awesome. Mm. Uh, coming back, the I didn't like the recruits that came in. They weren't that talented. Um, the way we stacked up in the Big Ten was not appealing to me. And I and I and so I was like, I had an opportunity to go pro, and I was like, sure, I'm I'm going to take that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, explaining that to my parents, it was a letdown because it it seemed like I was the odds of someone going back to college are so slim. Yeah. You know, that was, it was like, you know, you're not going to do this. <laughs> you know, you're not going to follow up on your promise. That was their attitude. Right. You know, you're not going to do this. You know, you're not going to go back. And because it ain't about the money, it isn't about the NFL. That like, that's not who, that's not who you are. That's not what's going to uh, complete you uh, on this planet uh, was the message. My uh, parents were uh, saying to me and I was like, I hear all that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, um, you know, even for, you know, if you can imagine for a black family to say, yeah. you know, my son is going to go to the NFL, mm -hmm. it, it sounds ludicrous. It doesn't sound right. real. Uh, all these uh, um, uh, stories that I've been reading, um, you know, it started to really come to fruition. Maybe they didn't understand how obsessed I was with the mm -hmm. sport. Um, you know, I, I, one story that I, I tell is like, uh, I, when I, even when I was in elementary school and I was playing football, I'd just be so uh, serious or even baseball. Right. You know, I'd play an entire baseball game and then come home and then set up a spare tire on a bucket and pitch into the tire, into the mm -hmm. rim. Wow. And, after the game, I'd just be so obsessed with sports, or I'd be bouncing a ball, tennis ball off the wall, and like catching. I, I could, I would do it for hours. I'd be so obsessed with the sports, and my and my dad said to me one day, he's like, "Man, he's like, you need to relax. Yeah, you know, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get hemorrhoids, or you're gonna get an ulcer <laughs> if you don't relax." And and I said to him at the time, I was like, you know what, Dad? I was like, I got this figured out. <laughs> you know, like that was that was my response. And so uh, to to get the the opportunity it was like everything kind of came to yeah. fruition. And it was like that. It was like a flashback to that moment where I was I was 
home talking to them about this decision that I made on my own, just like I made it on my own because they put the ball in my court right. for selecting colleges. They like I was a, an adult making my own decisions. So I make this decision. I'm home explaining it to them. First time I've seen my mom cry. Mm. And it was because she thought that I was abandoning the uh, my hope, my opportunity to be successful right. for a gamble. Mm. And um, but uh, everything kind of came to um, this moment where it was like, all right, you know, you got this figured out. Well, go for it. Hmm. Wow. Amazing. That's crazy. And uh, I mean, you always have to, uh, especially for athletes, if they feel like they're, they're ready, I think you got to take that risk. It's a high, a high reward, but low, I mean, low, uh, wait, how do you say it? low risk, high reward? Yeah. So, but you always have to take that risk as a, as an athlete, especially. Yeah. 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 So uh, tell our fans about your draft experience. You got drafted in 03 round four pick 124 by the San Francisco, San Francisco 49ers, a great organization, great franchise, a great fan base. You played at Candlestick Park back in the day. So what mm -hmm. was that like uh, getting the call from the 49ers? Well, the you know, the the draft experience for me was, you know, I was I was very angry <laughs> because I was projected to be a first day pick. Oh wow! Uh, which was um, uh, first to third round. So we're thinking um, uh, middle first, middle second round, uh, uh, early third, and um, that was a, this was an incredible incredible receiving core draft. Um, hmm. uh, Charles Rogers, yeah. Taylor Jacobs, uh, Anquan Bolden. Wow. I mean, just like <laughs> super, super loaded. These dudes wow. were so cold. Yeah. And um, and uh, even 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 so, even so, even even with the attitude that I had about the NFL happened to me, the the you know this isn't going to define me. I was still mm. angry mm. Uh, uh, about the results because I thought. I was easily a first day pick. Right. I slipped all the way to the fourth round to the 49ers. They called me. They're just like ecstatic. They're like, Oh, I just cannot believe you yeah. <laughs> slipped this far. Yeah. And, um, the receiver coach was just incredible. Uh, Eric Yarber, uh, he coached, um, uh, TJ Hushmanzada and Chad Johnson out of yeah. Oregon state. Okay. So he's with Dennis Erickson, yeah. uh, with the 49ers. And there's just, um, so uh, to, to get to the team um, in 2003, the 2002 campaign, they lost to the uh, New York Giants mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a crazy uh, um, uh, last second victory. Uh, so I, I'm going to a playoff team, a good team, and I'm excited about that. And uh, going, to, going to Cali also. I always yes. consider myself like a Cali dude anyway. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I get to go to Cali. I get to play for the 49ers, and right. especially in this organization. I studied so much Joe Montana and Jerry Rice film, and then Deion Sanders went there. Um, then Jerry Rice, Steve Young. I mean, it was I was obsessed with the 49ers, with yeah. the with the um, the organization and the team. So that was um, a, a dream come true, and it was again until you get on the fo football field and it's like, now you got to earn it. Yeah. And so that was, that was um, a, a tough aspect. So I usually describe the, the process of acclimating to, um, to the NFL. It's like, it's like a college game is the speed yeah. of uh, NFL practice. <laughs> and so it's like you get out there on the field and then you, you, you kind of, some people just don't catch up. Mm -hmm. So it was just strange. It's kind of like, uh, going from you know, like middle school to high school, some of the kids that were good in middle school weren't good in high school. They, it just didn't click. They wow. just didn't step up and rise up and get strong enough to compete. Same thing happened in college. And then in the NFL was just like, so I always had that in my mind was like, when is this going to happen? Yeah. When is this going to click? When am I going to get strong? When am I going to get fast? And it was like, I hope, you know, Tony Parrish doesn't take my head off. <laughs> and ruin my chances of yeah. making it in the NFL before I get fast enough and strong enough to, to compete. But uh, playing in, in Candlestick, amazing, dream come true. San Francisco, it was just, it was just uh, one of the most amazing 
uh, uh, cities just geographically um, in the world to me, you know, being so close to Napa, being uh, so close to uh, Carmel, yeah. um, uh, the proximity to Los Angeles, Metropolis, San Francisco, um, you know, 45 minutes to Vegas. It was just uh, wow. such a neat location to be in. Yeah, you know, especially the warm weather too. You know, you must have you must have loved the warm weather also. Nah, it was it was cold in San Francisco. <laughs> I always loved that Mark Twain quote. I I finally understood what he was talking about. Um, uh, coldest winter I ever had was a summer in San Francisco. Uh, uh, so it was. It, <laughs> I, I was able to wear a lot of coats out there. <laughs> yeah. So um, throughout your career, you got to learn from some of the great receivers in the league. Some of the great quarterbacks like Tom Brady, Mark Burnell, Jeff Garcia. Um, we actually, I actually, um, we had uh, Jeff Garcia on the show two years ago, and it was an honor talking right to him. On. Yeah, he was oh, he's yeah. awesome. Yeah, and he's um, a gem. yeah. So for you, what throughout your obviously you spent the one. It, let me ask you this: How I'm just curious. Uh, tell our fans how frustrated was it uh, that the team, uh, the the team that drafted you, the 49ers? Do you ever think to yourself maybe you could have spent your whole career with one team or? But NFL is a business, so there's a lot of movement. So for you, what did you learn from from for the 49ers first and going to team to team to team? But you get to learn different cultures, different teammates, different players. And like I said earlier, you, you got to learn from the best from each team. Well, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, what was difficult to me, because I always had such really good relationships with head coaches, with coaches in general, just with yeah. the coaches. I was uh, like a coach's pet. Yeah. Because I gave a, effort, a bunch of effort and I was fun and jovial and I kept things light and then I can get serious out on the football yeah. field. You know, I was like, it was, I was a coach's pet. So I was always in close relationships with my head coaches. And when I got to San Francisco, it was no different. Dennis Erickson, his kids took a liking. I had um, an experience with him. He invited me to Thanksgiving my rookie year because, you know, he was just kind of – he was worried about me <laughs> being away from home. And, you know, I, I, even though I was the only player that he, you know, um, um, had over, I think he invited some of the other younger players, but they just didn't come. Mm -hmm. But um, at his house on Thanksgiving, you know, he said to me, he's like, he's like you're a good kid. But I can't, I can't get too close. Hmm. He's like, because I may have to cut you. Wow. And so that was um, just a lesson to me early in my career about the business, like you said, of playing in the NFL. And it wasn't as um, loving environment, nurturing environment as it was at the University of Illinois. Um, you know, the, most of the lessons... I learned at San Francisco was what not to do because I was right. behind Terrell Owens yeah. and his behavior in that locker room was the antithesis of what a young person is taught on and how to behave as a teammate um, in a team sport. So it was kind of, it was, you know, just the, uh, the, his behavior towards coaches, his behavior towards other teammates, uh, his unwillingness to practice, even though when he was out there, it was some of the best practice anyone would ever witness and then on Sunday was just some of the most amazing you know catch and runs I mean you would ever see it was just it was it was unbelievable to look at it was it was spectacular to see um, but there's just so many opportunities actually to uplift and provide um, a, 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 like an apprenticeship opportunity that <clears throat> I learned when uh, Tara Lawrence left yeah <clears throat> Because when I start, when I was thrusted into a starting role my second year, the organization brought in uh, Curtis Conway. Mm. So he was a ten-year. He was like I think it was on his tenth or eleventh yeah. year that uh, that time. And then he acted as the mentor to me mm. on, um, you know, uh, how to approach these games, professionalism, how to uh, handle teammates, how to handle off the field. Yeah. You know, he was married to Layla Ali. Oh, wow. you know, so it was just like I was just like looking at him <laughs> like, dude, like. <laughs> like jeez he's uh you tell me anything yeah um uh obviously the coaches were amazing because that <clears throat> coach arbor keeps shouting him out he's going he's in the super bowl now coaching for the la rams so yeah. really shouting him out a lot uh proud of him but just the the 
the lessons I learned from him, <clears throat> you know, he would um, shed a tear every training camp hmm. just because he had to cut players. Just, he was just so invested in, in teaching and training. And obviously he was amazing with the skills and the footwork and he put, he could put a lot of wiggle in a player's right. game um, and getting open and, and quick feet. Um, but then he was also invested as a man in our lives. So it was just the coaches. And then when they fired Dennis Erickson and then they brought in uh, Mike Nolan, Jerry Sullivan was the receiver yeah. coach who played another fantastic role. He's just a legendary coach. Um, um, he, he coached Tony Brown uh, with the, um, uh, San Diego Chargers, um, uh, David Boston down in Arizona. So he had uh, Anquan Bolton his first year in the NFL. So he was just he no, your your screen froze. Oh, sorry. The, oh. um, where, where, where did I cut out at? Uh, uh, oh, you were talking about something, the coach, one of the coaches, I think. Yeah, Jerry Sullivan and yeah. um, the, uh, uh, Curtis Conway. My third year in San Francisco, the organization brought in uh, Johnny Morton. So it was just another aspect because Johnny Morton was coached by Jerry Sullivan yeah. uh, in Detroit. And so they, they kept bringing in these older players to, um, to be around me and mentor me. And I just thought that that was a, a fantastic experience. And that's what I took forward in the National Football League was just the, the game that those guys were giving me um, on the field and off the field, uh, what I was willing to uh, accept. Those dudes were patient. If, they, if, you know, if I was willing to sit and listen to them, they were willing to talk. Yeah. You know? And uh, the moments when I was, wasn't interested, they didn't press it. So it was just really neat. Um, uh, those experiences and how the organization uh, sought to to mentor me. So yeah, it was kind of like, um, but when Mike Nolan came in, he didn't like the existing players. Oh wow! He purged the purged the team. Hmm. So it was like um, one thing I noticed in the National Football League is that it's the once the coach that drafts you is no longer on the team, then it's like all bets are off. You no longer have right. stability. Um, on the on in that organization, so um, or the general manager. Once those people are replaced, all bets are off, and then you're just kind of left to float. And um, and that's kind of how I got uh, caught on with um, Chicago because yeah. Ron Turner was back in the NFL, and uh, he scooped me up uh, off the Washington Commanders when you know I uh, butted heads with the organization and hmm. um, uh, was released two years into a seven year contract. Yeah. Ron Turner scooped me up, brought me to Chicago. Uh, when the Bears didn't want me back, Josh McDaniels yeah. brought me to Denver because yep. he ran my pro day at the University of Illinois, right? Yeah. So it was like, then you have, you're kind of, they're stuck with these other connections that you have within the league of people who's, who believe in uh, the player's talent. And then um, uh, that's that part where, you know, the, the effort and the opportunity meet. And that's what I, I like to talk about is just, the uh, I was always gonna give effort. It didn't matter what team I was on. It didn't matter who the quarterback yeah. was. Um, didn't matter how bad they were, how good they were. <laughs> I was gonna give maximum effort. And then all I needed was opportunity. And so you just kind of have to um, uh, sit back and be patient and be ready, so you don't have to get ready for, for these moments to to seize opportunity. Hey, you you put up. Hey, you you're a full force receiver, man. You put up great numbers in your career, so you should be proud of yourself. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, speaking of Josh McDaniels, obviously, uh, he brought you in in Denver. He so, um, obviously he was not ready that time as a, to be a head coach, but now he got a head coaching job with the Raiders. And do you do you think this time he's ready be, uh, by by learning underneath Bill Belichick? Right. Yeah. I, I think this time he's ready because he has uh, a general manager. Yeah. That that they're in line, right? They they've worked together before in New England and. Uh, they understand they, they don't have to get to know each other. They don't have to understand yeah. how to draft, who to draft, what the terminology is. They're on the same page and th they should uh, be able to, to move forward. Mm -hmm. and, and there shouldn't be any hiccups with um, uh, personnel. There shouldn't be any hiccups with uh, the direction of the team. And so I, I, that's the, the, the key component. Yes, Josh was 
33 years old when um, he was on the Denver Broncos, but I, there was a couple other factors that weren't uh, in his favor. Uh, one, it's just uh, he didn't have the credibility within the coaching staff that was, that was also brought in. Uh, I don't think those were his picks is that uh, weren't able to coach to his um, uh, uh, scheme. He, he was brilliant. He could, he could, you know, he started on the defensive yeah. side of the ball, yeah. like Josh did uh, in the NFL, but uh, he's brilliant. And so the schemes that he would put together for the defense, the defensive coaches thought that it should be done a different way. So it was just mixed signals. Uh, the poor coaching on the defense, poor coaching in the special teams, and they just weren't able to execute and keep up with the offense. Wow. The offense was putting up spectacular numbers, yeah. um, uh, even with Brandon Marshall, mm -hmm. uh, even in the Brandon, Mar Brandon Marshall uh, year that Josh had him. And then the, that next year, I was in there uh, yeah. putting up similar numbers. So it was um, – the offense was never the issue. It was just his communication um, – uh, with the other coaches. And I think that's what uh, was the humble pie that he was able to eat, mm. you know, and we call it humble pie. Yeah. He goes back to New England and wins another championship. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right. You know, he, so he's, his credibility is there. It's just kind of like, we're waiting for him to get it. <laughs> so that, so that people give the man the respect he's, that is due um, uh, when he's coaching these teams. <laughs> Did you reach out to him? After he got the Raiders job, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, and and I I speak with him um, frequently throughout the years. It, it, wow. You know, it, it's just another one of those uh, relationships with uh, the player and the coach, and it's it's long lasting. It's long lasting, you know, like my relationship with Bob Beatty and hmm. Ron Turner and um, and Josh. You know, falls right into that category. Wow. Yeah, so uh, we have a couple of fan questions in here. Uh, someone wants to know. Great. So someone wants to know your best moment so, uh, in, in, in your NFL career. Oh, no, that's um, – I'll, I'll definitely pick the 2010 season. The yeah. entire – it's a moment. <laughs> the whole thing is a moment, um, you know, because it's just like the flashback of playing Super Tech Mobile. Yeah. Uh, the, the in the in the Pro Bowl game and um, it's just uh, to, for that moment to actually happen, you know, to me, that was it was incredibly humbling, and it was it was rewarding. It was it was definitely the the, the best moment to be voted by my peers, uh, coaches and players, uh, to the uh, Pro Bowl and to be All Pro. Yeah. Like, that was just the, that's the, that, that was the pinnacle of my uh, athletic career. Wow. And also you were the, one of, one of the years you were the NFL leading reception. Uh, uh, and what was that? Like? What did that mean to you? That was, that was the year. Exactly. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, yeah th that was the year. Cause it was, um, you know, my, my method for that season was I was just going to take each week as an event. So seven days, it's an event. Yeah. Once it was over, it was on to the next event. So it was just, I took it a week at a time and it wasn't, I, I did my best not to go to think too far forward yeah. until it was like, the media was like, Brandon, you're four or five games in. You got more yards than you ever had in <laughs> a whole season. You got in like five games, you know? So I couldn't, I was like, I was trying to downplay it <laughs> and then I just couldn't downplay it anymore. And, <laughs> uh -huh. and so that was really, um, it, it was, it was neat as it was happening to be aware of it and to be remarkably healthy. I think that was the other component to it. Yes. Just like, thank the man yeah. upstairs. It was just, I was going into, I probably went into of those 16 games. I went into probably eight. I was, it's probably nine or 10 of those games where I was, one of a, a neck back, neck tweak nothing a pull here a, a roll ankle or nothing I, I was like a hundred percent and that was just a, a blessing in its in its in, it, in its own self hmm. and uh what one of the other fans want to know obviously they you play for denver so they want to know the uh, can you uh, give a 
can you talk about the late uh, Demarius Thomas? Mm, 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 mm. Um, you know, uh, Demarius and I weren't close. Um, because it was it was like the relationship yeah, yeah. Uh, that I was talking about with uh, Curtis Conway and Johnny Morton. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was comfortable in where I was in my athletic career. So I was really looking to learn a lot from those mm -hmm. two men and, and they gave, gave me the game. Yeah. You know, Damaris was a first round pick. So when he got on the team, he thought he was better than me. Mm. Right. Yeah. And so that's just components of the way the locker room works and just the team dynamic. Right. So um, he wasn't trying to learn from me, <laughs> you know, because wow. he thought he, he, he had it figured out. Yeah. And so and so that was just my part as a as a veteran was uh, what I said to myself uh, with him and with, uh, Eric Decker was these dudes can learn from me from yeah. my work ethic. Mm -hmm. Right. I, that was another thing that I picked up from playing with TO. So they weren't going to pick up bad habits looking at B Lloyd. Right. They weren't going to do that. They were going to pick up good habits. Yeah. And regardless if they talked to me, asked me questions, pick my brain, wanted to know anything, which they did not, they picked up good habits. And and that's one of the the um, uh, the the things that I know that I left an impression on the younger receivers uh, mm -hmm. with the Broncos was good habits. Oh, oh. yeah. So uh, I want to ask you about your Patriots career and what was it like playing for the Patriots underneath Bill Belichick? Tom, obviously one of the best quarterbacks ever to play. Tom Brady, the goat, officially retired. Uh, retired, but for you at that time. Uh, what made Tom Brady uh, like you so much, becoming your becoming the favorite receiver that he loved and throwing to you? And what made that connection and the bond work together so quickly when he went to New England? And tell us about that story. Mm, mm. Well, Tom had been watching me for that entire time period yeah. with um, with Denver because we were running the exact same offense. Yeah, and um, and and. A couple of years prior to me getting to um, uh, New England, it would the what came up with him was you know like, how are you getting so many yards per catch? Y'all, how are you running play yeah. action? Yeah. You don't even have a run game in Denver. <laughs> you know, those are the things he would say. Yeah. Uh, uh, he'd say, you know, like wh where where are these plays? These plays aren't in the playbook, and that's the, and these are the things that made Josh so unique and his creativity. So when I got to New England, I came with a set of routes and plays. And, and so I think that was what was remarkable about it was that um, playing within that offense, which was uh, centered on slot and tight end and between the hash play, mm -hmm. that the, his offense has this whole outside the numbers, yeah. um, uh, 20 plus yard, uh, big play element to it that he he never had until he had Randy Moss. Yes. Right. And 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 those weren't um, detailed routes. Those are go routes or or uh, flag uh, you know flag posts where he's like right. beating the guy so bad he just puts his hand up and then Tom just lets it go. Yeah. Um, where uh, in Denver we were actually built in double moves or three moves into a route into the offense and I think. Oh. Tom really respected that yeah. the uh, the attention to detail. Uh, I think he he uh, appreciated <clears throat> my seriousness yeah. about uh, being a pass catcher and a route runner. He really appreciated that. And so what I was saying to myself was, <clears throat> with Tom, I'm the fourth option. I, I was able to execute that as the fourth option. Wow. He was throwing to Wes Welker. He was throwing to Gronkowski as a second option. Yeah. Aaron Hernandez as the third option. And myself, I can say I was the fourth option in that offense. Hmm. And so what I was saying to myself is, uh, I never know when he's going to uh, choose to throw me the ball. Right. Because it's just, it's how his mind's working. Uh, we're seeing the same things. We had a, we had a moment uh, uh, in one of the first couple games there with uh, Tennessee Titans. Mm -hmm. I was, I, 
I was so wide open and I was running down the field and I slowed down. I'm like, dude's just going to drop it right in the bread bag. Yeah. No, he threw it. He threw it as a, a catch on the catch and run. Wow. I thought he was just going to drop it to me in the bread basket. He threw it a catch and run and it went over my head. Whoa. I, I fell down and um, he said, don't stop running. And it was kind of like, boom, mm. won't make that mistake again. Yeah. It was like, oh, like, mm. like, what if he chooses not to throw me the ball? Right. You know, so I was, that's what I said. It's like, I never know when he's going to choose to throw me the ball. So I'm going to get as wide open as I could, wow. regardless if I'm getting the, if, I, if I'm one option or not. And so I, that, that was just the level of detail that I put into all my routes uh, in practice and then in the games. And, and I just was able to uh, get his respect. Um, the other thing about Tom is he'll be, he'll say, all right, uh, we put in this new play. Um, uh, let's run it before practice. 10, uh, let's get uh, 10, 20 reps. Let's get 20 reps um, full speed before practice. And then practice is full speed because mm -hmm. Tom never came out of practice. Yeah. So the backup would get probably five or 10 snaps out of 80 snaps of practice because yeah. Tom wouldn't come out. And so when Tom's in, all the projected starters are in. <laughs> Tom playing full speed, everybody's playing full speed. Yeah. And so um, uh, we run the play in practice, uh, coming towards the end of practice, he's like, hey, I didn't like the way we were uh, connecting on that play. Let's get 20 more after practice, oh. uh, full speed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like the, um, yeah. and, and to be game for that and to be up for that, it's just, um, the uh how i was able to develop a, a good a working relationship with tom well and uh you'd ever bring up that story from uh, your college days beating him i did i did yeah. yeah 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 i was like you know i you know i intercepted that ball at the end of the game because you know i was on the i was on the um wow. uh the bat down team for the hail mary and so i was back there tom cr tries to crank one up <laughs> out there and it and it gets tipped and it goes in the air and i'm like i'm gonna intercept this yeah. ball because i want to intercept Perception on my college wow. stats and so i dove for it and got my hands under it they called it incomplete but <laughs> hey so the, uh, th this is how i put it whoever intercepts the ball from tom brady is part of his 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 part of his history also <laughs> I do, right i didn't <laughs> it, it didn't get it didn't count they did not give me that interception oh they, wow. but yes i let them about that <laughs> yeah so um so how ecstatic was josh mcdaniels to get you back with him you know there's not much room to be ecstatic in the new england patriots at yeah. that time <laughs> <laughs> there was like there there was no fun you know there you know the 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 fun was in uh you know getting to the playoffs and yes. you know, and getting to the championship so yeah to answer that question I wasn't there to play with Bill. Mm -hmm. I was there to play with Josh and to play with Tom. Yeah. That was it. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, you know, I, my relationship with Bill was, you know, non-existent other than just the, the, the relationship he had just given the meetings. I think it was um, a, a, an incredible exercise in discipline. Um, the way that he addressed the team for, you know, up to an hour every morning. It was something I'd never seen on any other team. Some of these coaches completely would blow off that morning meeting. <clears throat> but Bill had a story, had a message every morning. I, my seat was next to Wes Welker, and, um, and Wes could lip the messages. He, would, he could um, – um, uh, word for word, he could repeat the messages. That's how long Bill has been doing these messages. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's an incredible exercise in discipline. And uh, the most uh, remarkable part that I witnessed from Bill was just, he was a better teacher than I thought he was. I didn't know he was uh, such a good teacher. And, um, uh, and it kind of spilled over outside of just talking about X's and O's and, uh, and being uh, a stickler for the details, which is why New England won so much, mm -hmm. is because they won the situational game. And that's what he was really teaching, the game within the game. 
It's not about first and 10. It's about where the ball is on the field and your percentages to score. You know, hmm. as much as he pretends like he's not analytics, it was all analytics, right. um, uh, which is why there was such an importance on special teams because you're changing the field and then the percentages of a team scoring being, you know, inside their own 10 versus being, you know, outside their own 20, it's drastic. So it was just the game within the game, which he was really good at teaching, but then outside the game, um, it would be uh, moments like for Memorial Weekend and, you know, he'd call up one of the rookies <laughs> and like, you know, what you know about Memorial Week, Memorial, uh, Memorial Day. And they're like, uh, you know, uh, Vegas, uh, pool, pool parties, you know, <laughs> you know, and it'd be like this funny moment where, you know, these young players uh, are talking about something that doesn't have to do with the holiday. And then Bill would launch into how many soldiers died oh. um, in, in American wars. Yeah. Um, uh, the importance of uh, World War Two and um, and uh, Afghanistan and, and you know he really took a lot of time to talk about things outside of football and and I thought that was uh, another fantastic experience with the New England Patriots. Well, <clears throat> yeah, we have two more fans questions that just came in. One, someone wants to know uh, what was your uh, when Tom Brady retired? Uh, did they um, did you uh, reach out to him? To say congrats, I didn't. No, nah. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and then uh, one of our other friends, uh, fans, want to know what is your hype music throughout your career? Oh damn! You know, I listen to a lot of my own music because uh, uh, I've recorded a bunch of music. So uh, um, I listen to um, uh, personally. Uh, I have a song called Chamber, and uh, oh, oh. which was uh, one of my absolute favorite songs that I played. So I usually in my pregame set, I'd have a, a, a set of my music. Um, but the major artists that I listened to uh, during my career, I, you know, at the beginning, it was, you know, in 2003, it was, you know, Nelly and Lil Jon, you know, the crunk music yeah. came on the scene. Um, I, I kept Metallica in my playlist. Uh, Unforgiven was another uh, song that I played all throughout my career. Um, uh, I liked uh, Willie Nelson, obviously getting off of the hip hop music, but um, uh, uh, Ludacris, uh, Lil Wayne was mm -hmm. influential. Uh, Jada Kiss was a huge artist. Um, oh, Rick Ross. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. um, uh, two chains, Kanye West stayed in there heavily. Meek Mill. No, he, he came out, he came out later. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, I, you know, cause I was out in two, 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I didn't have any Meek Mill running, uh, in 2015, but yeah, <laughs> It's, it's an extensive playlist, and I, and there's also some classical music in there because I do like um, uh, uh, classical music. And, and you have your own music too. That's awesome. Um, not only Brandon Lloyd is a football player; he's in rap. He got bars. He's a rapper. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, I, so I want to ask you. Uh, so, looking back at your career, how grateful are you to be in this position uh, to be able to play the game you love? Your the your father introduced you to this game, making your family proud and work, uh, proving the doubters wrong, working hard uh, and, and, and going through obstacles throughout your career, getting to where you want to be, which was the NFL and, and, and having coaches from, from day one behind your back, having that support system. How great are you to be in this position right now? You know, um, words can't explain it. You know, I just... Uh... I think uh, the 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 best thing that I can do is just to continue to all this energy that I've harnessed from you know all the influencers that have been in my life. All I can do is just reciprocate that back out into the world. Yeah, and 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 that's that's my you know, that's my motive. That's my message. It's just I've been um, I've been blessed. I know it, and. Um, 
I, all I can do now is continue to, to work on myself personally, uh, develop myself, continue to improve so I can continue to be a positive influence for those in my immediate sphere yeah. and, 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 and be available uh, philanthropically, which is uh, why I serve for CareerWise Colorado here in, in Denver. Um, we are um, uh, in the workforce development space. Um, we're, we're an apprenticeship program and we uh, place high school students in white collar roles. So, you know, we're uh, shifting the, the lens of uh, apprenticeship from, you know, metalworking and woodworking to uh, finance and IT and uh, education. So, um, you know, our goal is to create a long term uh, talent development solution for businesses and career opportunities for young people. You know, that's the wow. that's the elevator pitch. You know, our, you know, our vision is a more equitable system yeah. to where um, uh, the barriers for economic mobility are lowered. So more young people can enter into uh, the middle class yeah. and uh, our ad adaptation to the Swiss dual education model where students go to school and then uh, they get school credit for going to work. Wow. They become uh, part-time W-2 employees. And so for students who don't see college as an option right away, um, for whatever reason that is, I want to get straight to the money. Uh, uh, let's get them out of low-wage jobs, uh, uh, low-skilled jobs, and into jobs that have a whole bunch of upward mobility. And, and also the other component to that, is training businesses to view young people as capable of of having those type of roles, yeah. and so that's what I love about my my role now, uh, being in business development and uh, the apprenticeship ambassador for CareerWise, is that I get to work with businesses every day, uh, in in the realm of uh, like you know the diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, because businesses ask me like, well, well, what can we do? We didn't even know. Providing an uh, an apprenticeship was an option to a solution to this challenge, um, but it's providing these young with an access to a network that they don't have at home. You know, they don't have parents who can introduce them to yeah. an owner of a business or because <clears throat> their parents themselves are working in a lot of times in low income jobs. So um, uh, career wise is another one of my, uh, avenues to where I can say to myself is I can, you know, pushing that energy out into the world, making a difference for young people, um, uh, staying connected, uh, in the community, uh, staying connected in the business community, also having a solution for them as they're uh, looking to solve their challenges, uh, oh. in this world moving forward. Oh, that's amazing. That, that's amazing. Yeah. Keep up the great work with that. Uh, that's, that's truly, uh, uh, helping out the youth it's it's uh, now this generation is all about helping out the youth so uh, the, that that's amazing what you're doing and um tell our fans about um i want to talk about this brian flores situation and mm. um and uh, we're part of the we help out hugh jackson with this foundation and he uh he was on the news recently sports center and cnn and uh doing those interviews and um i, I we have we have uh, brian flores back 100 uh he's he has all the right to be frustrated and um, but what are your thoughts on Brian Flores and uh, what, what, what can we do to help change this and have more minority coaches in the league as head coaches? Yes, I, I think it's, it's unfortunate. You know, I, I believe that we have to wait till for the legal process. We, we, gotta, we have to wait and, uh, and see if these allegations are true, see what the, the court system comes up with because – Unfortunately, you know, it, now this issue, you know, he's at the mercy of the courts. Yeah. And, and um, obviously the, the timing of the, the text with uh, Belichick or, you know, they bring up some concerns. Yeah. But, you know, there's also another side, you know, there's, there's an easy mistake, both assistants, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how this plays out, see how much uh, Bill's willing to divulge that he knew. I think that there's a component right. there um, on how he knew, what he knew, why he knew, but you know, it's just gonna take some time. Yeah. I think that, here's what I think is important about what um, Flores is going through. Um, this is where Kaepernick failed. He was to articulate the message. Brian Flores is doing an amazing job yeah. articulating the message. Mm -hmm. where, where, what his point is, 
why he's making the point, and then their strategic rollout of the evidence. That's what makes this so important and impactful and why this is going to make a difference in uh, the diversity in the, in the head coaching uh, realm. Now, um, personally, there's a, a lack of head coaches, uh, of black head coaches. Yes. Obviously, white head coaches are getting these job opportunities and they're, you know, not even that qualified. Yeah. You know, there's not a reason why Leslie Frazier should have been interviewing for a head coaching job for the last eight and not have one by now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he cannot be that unqualified to be a head coach, right? There's probably 10 other situations like that. Jim Caldwell is another one. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I think what we can do is continue to amplify this message. Yeah. Right? I don't think that, you know, these, these owners do what they want to do anyway. You know, it's, you know, I, I can't say anything that hasn't already been said about that uh, uh, good old boys club network. Mm -hmm. But if we continue to amplify these messages and share these stories and give these um, um, uh, black men platforms to speak, and when they step up like they've been doing and they can yeah. articulate exactly what their point is and what their argument is, now we're onto something. Like this yeah. is the message moving forward. Um, this is what Billie Jean King was able to do this yeah. is what muhammad ali was able to do this is this is how you become a civil rights leader is you have to be able to go in there and go bar for bar with the media and get this message out and fight whatever pushback is is levied your way you have to be able to talk through it and sort through it and evolve and have the legal defense to help you with these arguments. And so I, I just, I think it's just a, a blessing that um, Flores is the man to do this. It's unfortunate he's losing his passion. He may lose the love, what he loves the most yeah. to do, to be the leader of men uh, and, and coach the coach in the in National Football League. It's unfortunate that he's probably going to lose that opportunity. I hope not. But I'm glad he's the one that's stepping up and speaking on behalf of this issue. Yeah, and I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping teams look at this saying, "This is the type of coach I want to lead my team." For him taking a risk to do this, mm. I think teams. Oh, I'm hoping teams look at this in a, in a different way and not 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 uh, disagree with this. I want teams to look at give him uh, look give him a chance, and this is the, the right coach. I want to leave, leave. He's a heck. Look, he took the Dolphins to like what two straight playoff appearances, and he got fired after the third season. Um, so, I mean, this guy deserves another chance, and, and to see what he's doing now, I, I'm hoping teams see that in, in a positive way. Agreed. Yeah, it, it's gonna be inter interesting to see. And I'm, we have. I told, I, I tweeted this. I have Brian Flores back 100, percent and uh, this, he's doing the right thing. I don't care if it's a, a risk thing. But this is the right thing to do, in my opinion. That's right. Yeah. So uh, before a couple more things before I let you go, and Great. what advice? Yeah. What what advice would you give to younger athletes um, that are trying to get to their goals, or some of some of these players have to work a little bit harder to get where they want to do, where, where they want to be? But what advice would you give? You know. You know, I I just stick with my old school advice. You know, the uh, pick a college that has a degree that's going to mean something to you in the event that making it to the NFL doesn't happen, you know, making it to the ultimate goal doesn't happen. Yeah. Cause that's what I was saying to myself. It's like the odds were less than 1% that I'd make it to the national football league. So that wasn't even my goal. That wasn't even the point. The point was to continue to play the game. Um, that's going to give me a college education for free and then take that college education along with all the skills that I had learned of being a student athlete with me into the business market. And it doesn't matter when that happens. You know, the, uh, you know, I left school early, but I went back and finished school, oh. uh, in 2018, I walked with the class of 2018, <laughs> you know, 15 years later. Wow. Hey, but that, right? that, that's, uh, that's what people do now. Go up and go back to school and finish their degree. So, so you can always go back. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, that's my message for uh, the youth that I speak to 
uh, within the career wise model and the young athletes, you know, go for school. I think yeah. it's confusing right now with the uh, NIL. Uh, I think that's a distraction for young people um, where uh, I think the NCAA should have, have offered up the NCAA money. <laughs> yeah. That's the money that the students are entitled to. They're not, they don't need, they shouldn't be out hustling, pimping themselves out uh, for change out here, added responsibility of now they need to hire an accountant. Now they need to hire a manager. Like what's the difference between hiring an accountant, a manager, and a sports agent? Like yeah. it's just, it, it just, it muddied the, the situation. So I think old school advice, you know, go, go to a college where the education matters to you, the, where the, the major is good, you know, the, the major is like top notch for what you have access to good enough, that good, that good access that you have and, 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 and play it that way. Wow. Um, um, that was athletic advice. Is that what you're. Yeah. So like, yeah, I, I, yeah. So basically, yeah. Well, um, for young athletes um, that are trying to get to the goals, whatever sport they're playing, if they want to go pro or overseas, uh, yeah, just yeah. advice to lead them that way. Yeah. yeah, and then just you know, for for the the amateurs, it's you, you have to stay out, out of trouble. Mm -hmm. You have to stay out of trouble. That's the that's the only thing that will derail any athlete, you know, uh, looking to get any sort of goal, whether mm -hmm. that's going from middle school to being the the varsity quarterback. Surefire way you will not reach that goal is mm -hmm. not going to school, getting in trouble. Yeah, like you will not make it. So I think that's a, that's just the first step. Um, and then the, the next step is, you know, it, it's, it's tough because a lot of us don't have those role models built into our home network. And it's not just black people. It's not just um, the underserved communities. Um, a lot of people don't have a um, uh, uh, more moral and virtuous mm -hmm. role models to look to. And, and it's getting increasingly harder to find that you got to go out of your way to find these types of individuals. So, um, uh, you know, attempting to, to stay in, in that lane, you have to find those individuals. You have to curate your social media so that it is only feeding you those types of individuals. <laughs> And, and so that you can continue to uh, uh, consume that information. So, uh, you know, that, that's just a, a bit of technology advice that I follow. It's just, you have to curate it. You're, uh, what's feeding you the information so that you are getting what you want. Mm -hmm. Make sure that what you want isn't, you know, salacious and negative and um, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> misinformation and fake news. And yeah. you know, so it, it takes some wherewithal to, to do that take some work but once you have that then it's it's easier to, to navigate the world yeah so we have another fan question that came in but before we get to that um one of our co-hosts that who could who couldn't join tonight her name is tia Lyons. she wanted to ask you what are your thoughts on washington naming their team the commanders and also doug williams leading the way uh obviously the first uh, black quarterback to lead washington into that super bowl and you got and i actually i had the honor of talking to julie donaldson on my show, the one uh, she she works for Washington football team or Washington Commanders now. But what are your she want uh, one of our co-hosts wants to know what are your thoughts on the Commanders now? It was long overdue. Yeah, that was that was long overdue, and and it happened, <laughs> right? It, it finally it happened, and it's it's frustrating because the things that are etched in our minds about finally getting to this point. Yeah, was the resistance that Snyder put up to get to get here. Mm. It's 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 a, it's frustrating, but we're here. And, you know, as as far as. You know, uh, Doug Williams leading the campaign, you know, I just I don't, I don't have much to say. I haven't um, heard him uh, articulate his position on why he's stepping forward and doing this, but someone has to do it yeah someone has to do it uh he meant so much to this organization um uh as a, a barrier breaking um player uh role model 
Hall of Famer. It's a, it's a big deal. Someone needs to help Daniel Snyder through this mess. Mm-hmm. And because there's a whole entire fan base there who wants a winning team, who expects a winning team and a winning product, who they're, they're pay, giving their hard-earned money for those seats and to be there. So this organization needs that. So I'm happy that we're here. I'm, I'm, and I'm happy that Doug has stepped forward and is being the one to assist this organization through this quagmire that, you know, it got itself into. Yeah, we're the, you're the fifth, um, fifth uh, person that we had on the show that be, to be part of Washington uh, history. Uh, yeah, we had you, we had Julie Donson, we had Ken Harvey, we had Donovan McNabb on the show, we had, uh, and then we also had Jason Campbell, also part of Washington. And um, it's just uh, now seeing this team evolve, I feel like I think with this change, I think they're, they're going to be more motivated. I feel like they're heading into the right direction, in my opinion. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll see how they're, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll see how their scouting goes and, you know, how they're implementing, you know, because it all seems like damage control. Yeah. You know, he gets, he gets in trouble for sexual transgressions. And then all of a sudden he's like, brings in a black GM and, you know, it's just kind of like, eh, you know, the, the his motives for doing these, making these adjustments and these moves don't seem right. Uh, they didn't seem like that they, they, they were in the right place. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see if, um, if everything goes, you know, swimmingly, then, you know, we can be excited about that. But if, when things uh, have a downturn, let's see how they make it through. But let's see how the scouting goes, see how they draft, see how, you know, yeah. how Rivera, you know, it's fantastic coach. See how he turns this organization around from the inside. Cause this, this is a tough job. It's going to, it's going to be tough. Yeah. So before we get to the last two things, we're going to take two more fan questions. Uh, one of uh, two, two, or, two of our fans want to know, would you consider getting getting into coaching uh, down the line? And the one of the other fans want to know what was your nickname? <laughs> um, I will I will not get into coaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I don't I don't have the patience uh, for coaching, and um, uh, my nickname was B Lloyd. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was younger, I you know my elementary school when I was uh, playing baseball and, and uh, flag football, my coach called me hot dog because <laughs> I was always showing off, <laughs> making things a little bit more difficult than this yeah. year. I, you know, reverse the field when it was unnecessary or let the ball go a little further and die for it in wow. baseball or, you know, it was just, everything was really over the top and entertaining. So you know, I really liked that entertaining aspect. And then once I got to the NFL, I couldn't really stuck. You know, I was like, I always considered myself like a prime time. Yeah. But they was like, nah, man, Deion Sanders. Got yeah, me. Deion Sanders. And then I'd be like, oh, you know, <laughs> like, you can't be prime time, dude. Stop. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I was like, oh, I got all these moves. You know, you call me the Matrix, man. I'm like, <laughs> the Matrix. They're like, nah, Sean Marion. He's the Sean Marion. He's the, he's the Matrix the NBA. You can't be that. So it's like, you know. Some of the uh, guys make fun of me and call me Plastic Man. <laughs> I was like, you're so flexible. You're like plastic. <laughs> so I'm glad that one didn't stick. But that's the thing that I learned is that your nicknames pick you. You don't get to pick your nicknames. <laughs> I, I got I got one for you. Uh, B Fizzle. Yep. I, I tried a couple of the uh, Bonics ones that, you know, B Lizzle. I tried it and it, it, it just didn't stick. Nothing really stuck. <laughs> Yeah, so the last two things here now, uh, our team, I, I mentioned this earlier, our team is part of the Hugh Jackson Foundation, uh, former NFL coach. He's now the coach for Grambling State University. Um, we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, make sure the community stays safe, the kids stay safe. So we'll send you the foundation so you can go check it out. Thank you. Yeah. And the last thing here, uh, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and all the center workers right now? Oh man. Oh, thank you so much. You know, the, um, uh, it's the message of perseverance, you know, like, you know, uh, when are we going to come out of the back end? It's like, you can't even really think about that because you're so, um, uh, stuck in the middle of it. Yeah. So just thank you so much. 
uh, on behalf of those who um, can't thank you because they don't want to participate in the health and safety measures. And um, uh, we appreciate all, all your work. And um, please keep your strength and your willpower and uh, use all the um, tools out there uh, for health and wellness and mental health so that you can continue to stay in the game because we need you more than ever. Well, well said, and there you have it. That wraps up episode 974 with former Illinois NFL wide receiver Brandon Lloyd. Man, what a great career. He's doing good, great things off the field, man. He's helping out the youth right now. Go check him out on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, right? If, yeah. Um, and then we have to get you on Instagram, man. You got to get an Instagram now. <laughs> that's that's the next goal. But uh, no, but yeah, keep up the great work, man. Uh, this is truly an honor. Great conversation. Uh, you have an amazing story. Uh, keep uh, And not only a football player, uh, he's a rapper too. So go check out his music. Uh, but uh, we, would like, we would love to have you back on the show at some point down the line so you can meet the full team. But uh, like I said, thank you again for coming on. It was truly an honor and uh, stay safe. Fantastic. Thanks for having me on. And you can uh, see, uh, visit me on Twitter at yeah. Mr. B. Lloyd. Uh, you can visit me online, mrbloyd.com. And you can catch me on LinkedIn. Uh, for those of you who are in CareerWise Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, uh, message me. And uh, we're a nationwide organization. So uh, we can work in um, different markets, but uh, really look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for having me on and I uh, look forward to coming back. Congratulations with all your episodes, man. You did yeah, a thank, fantastic job, uh, thank, you and the entire team. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, where can fans find your music real quick? Uh, SoundCloud. Okay. Um, you can find me on SoundCloud and you can also find um, She All Mine, which is my record with uh, Bobby Valentino. Oh, wow. Um, okay. The one that peaked at uh, yeah. 47 on the uh, Billboard chart. Wow. Oh, congrats. Um, Urban chart in, uh, 2000, in 2008 wow. uh, on iTunes. That's awesome. Wow. That, that's amazing. Yeah. Congrats on that, man. Thank you. Yeah.